Well, hi everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of Pushing the Limits. Today, I have a very special guest, and uh, I've been wanting to interview this wonderful doctor for a long, long time. Um, he, he has, whether he's known it or not, influenced uh, my mum's journey with her recovery. And, and as you, my listeners, will know, uh, with mum's brain aneurysm, I went down a lot of tracks to find answers to help her, and this was one of the ones that I went down. So today, I have Dr. Lou Lim from the be like company with us. Dr. Lou, welcome to the show. Hi Lisa, thank you for inviting me to speak with you. <laughs> it's very exciting to talk yeah. to you. You're an incredible yeah. man, an incredible scientist, uh, and you, you, you're an engineer, you have an MBA, and you're a neuroscientist and a natural doctor. How, 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 do, how do you do all of that in one lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm older than you, I look baby. <laughs> <laughs> a number of years. <laughs> Incredible. Well, I, I, yeah, my, my emphasis today is really on this field of photobiomodulation. And but we, uh, you know, photobiomodulation spread out in a lot of areas, it's, as you might probably know. So it, it covers anything from aesthetic, cosmetic, wound healing, and, um, and you know, skin rejuvenation, hair growth. And you know, um, even um, affecting when you when you go into the physio phys physiological side, it can affect your your blood circulation. You know, it mm -hmm. can um, can help with pain, and that calls for um, an understanding of the what the different parameters can do, the, the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but we there's a you know I feel that there's a lot to be discovered for the brain and what it can do so that's where my my oh, emphasis is yep. so it, i guess it requires um background in of course uh, neuroscience and physiology natural medicine engineering i think that plays a very big part so, so it, you it's nice to have all this, of kind of skills all together <laughs> <laughs> So photobiomodulation, it's a very big word and, and a lot of people probably haven't even heard of what that is. Can you break that down, the, the photo part, the bio part and the modulation part um, and, and what it actually means? Yeah, uh, for, for a long time, you, this, this whole field was first discovered in 1967. So it went through the process of being called Phototherapy, co laser therapy, low level laser therapy. Um, for many years, it, got, it was known as low, low level light therapy because it doesn't necessarily have to be laser. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, the, you know, the, this, the scientists in this world got together and said, hey, we've got to have a unifying description of what, what this modality is. And we can go ahead and register with the medical, I think it's like a medical library in the US, mm -hmm. then you can get codes and be recognized and so on. And, and so on. So I guess people got together and decided, okay, let's call it photobiomodulation. And I thought this is a really big word. <laughs> it is a big word. It's a new word as well. <laughs> but I guess over the last few years, it, it kind of got more and more accepted and you know, it, now it flows off people's tongue more easily. And, uh, a photo is like, you know, bio is to do with you know, you know, the biology, the organisms, and your body, and, and, so, and so on. A modulation is to change, to modify. Mm -hmm. For either, uh, generally we aim for the good, but overdoing it can be bad. So it's actually uh, mo modulating or modifying the body. So, so when we talk, you know, we think about lasers. I know a lot of ladies out there would be uh, know that lasers are very good for the skin. You go to your local um, beautician mm -hmm. and they do laser therapy uh, for for skin rejuvenation. Um, I know that there was a study, uh, an older study on um, rats or mice where the hair the hair grew. So they use it for hair regeneration, for skin regeneration. Um, but there's a there's a whole lot more to lasers uh, and 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 photobiomodulation than just uh, hair and skin. Um, can you explain the different wavelengths and what they do and the different colors of the spectrum, if you like, of the, 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 the photo spectrum or the wavelengths and what, what they do, the different, the different wavelengths and the power of the hair? Yeah, um, 
so when you talk about photobiomodulation, uh, we're mainly referring to red and near infrared light. Mm -hmm. And why do we constrain, you know, in this uh, this 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 window? And that's that's for several reasons. We, you know, you have if you go to the high energy end, that would be blue, and you know, you go to ultraviolet, and go in, then you go to X-ray, gamma ray, and so on. Then you have the longer wavelength beyond uh, near infrared. You get far infrared. Then you get into microwave and Radio wow. waves. Yep. So it gives you a sense that these are all electromagnetic waves. Uh -huh. So it's not like they're all light. They're not just all light or X ray. And um, that covers, you know, that covers radio waves. So it gives you a sense that the longer the wavelength, it, the further it penetrates. Radio waves go through anything. Okay. The shorter wavelength is high energy. It doesn't penetrate much, not even the skin. When, when you go into uh, the, the very short wavelength, shorter than say ultraviolet C, and then you go into X, you know, X-ray and so on. But very high energy can start getting into imaging. But that's, uh, uh, but then you get into that spectrum where it can mutate. You know, they call it ionizing, mutate yep. your DNA and cause you problems like cancer. Yep. But red and infrared light uh, are absorbed by the mitochondria in the cells. The mitochondria are, are mainly known to be responsible for your energy. Mm -hmm. Cellular energy, your energy, anything you do, you think, involves uh, energy from the mit mitochondria. Now, so the absorption is mainly within the mitochondria, there is something called the respiratory chain mm -hmm. or the electronic transport chain. Yep. And we are, and so those of us who study biology will remember that it uh, is responsible for creating the energy. So this yes, change. your ATP. Yep, the ATP. And the theory is red and infrared light gets absorbed mm -hmm. in the respiratory chain. That releases more ATP and it frees this nitrate oxide um, that's clogged up in the chain yep. uh, and causes the cell to function below normal. So you freeze that, nitro oxide goes into your body. It helps with your circulation because that's what nitro oxide does. Mm -hmm. Then it does other things like, you know, it has releases transient free radical ROS, reactive oxygen species, which are also signaling molecules. Then leads to gene transcription. Yep. The creating this protein that helps to heal. So you get your skin rejuvenation because it releases these proteins, create these proteins that causes healing in the tissues, you know, that, that improve your collagen level. Wow. Uh, so that kind of thing. So so it's mainly red and infrared light. There are some uh, debate now about whether it is mainly, for many years, uh, most of us have been thinking that it's in the enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase in, in the one of the yep. side of my respiratory chain doing, doing this. But uh, today, maybe it's not. Maybe it is, it is to do with, um, you know, that... Uh, trans, uh, well, that's the membrane. The in, in well, I forget the exact term, but it's the the membrane, the the water, what the membrane, the water in a membrane layer. Yep. Um, Which is and, yeah, uh, the that, IMPs. Uh, yep. Yeah. So that that it may actually reduce the viscosity and help the. Uh, the some people call it a nanometer, but it is that's mm -hmm. been creates more ATP to be, be able to do that better. Wow. Okay. Um, so, so if we're looking... Interfacial membranes, right? Yeah. So, so mitochondria is a word, you know, that um, is a, extremely important. I don't think uh, a lot of people understand what mitochondria do. So mitochondria are like the little power packs in every single cell. And it's actually a, a, an ancient bacteria that's come into the human uh, system billions of years ago when we were evolving and the mitochondria is responsible for uh, this energy production in the cell so when you have a photobiomodulation device from say your company and it is sending in a red or a near infrared light wave the mitochondria it stimulates the mitochondria 
without going into the biochemical processes, but it stimulates the, the mitochondria to create more energy and more energy for healing. Is that sort of a, a very, you know, high level sort of lay person's overview of how that works? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess you, you know, it comes down to something called gene, tran gene transcription. Yes. So to produce the right read. Yeah. That leads, leads to this. So, um, so I guess energy is a very you know easy, easy way to remember it, but it really involves producing the right proteins. Um, you don't want to overdo it. You know when you overdo it, you overwhelm. You produce more free radicals than you want to. Uh huh. And you can get negative effects. So so some understanding of the you know it being low level and um, just do the necessary thing and not overdo it, not doing it too often. Uh, can lead to good things yeah yeah okay so so it's a bit like uh you know exercise you know the right amount of exercise is good right. for us doing too yeah. much is not good for us or not you know this is why you build your fitness um up yeah. and in the body uh so it, it creates a, a, a hormetic stress if you like is, is that what uh the the these devices are doing that the light is doing creating a hermetic stress that is net then or is it well you you Actually, there's a lot of similarity, right? Too much of exercise you produce, uh, the stress comes from a lot of free radicals and mm -hmm. the body overwhelmed by free radicals, not even not being able to clear it, you know. And then even exactly. your mitochondria is under some sort of stress because, um, I, actually, there was just a paper that was published a few days ago uh, saying that the mitochondria is also linked to the anxiety level wow. because you know this. If it's, it's stress, it's, uh, you create this unnecessary amount of, uh, I think, uh, stress hormones. hormones. You know, yeah, you know, you're not, you know, you, you're getting these stress hormones in in your body, in 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 the same way that's co is causing you anxiety. So, so the mitochondria uh, well-being is key. Mm. You want to release it from stress. So, I guess that's one of the reasons why. Uh, Low-level light therapy for the biomodulation is helpful because it just supports the mitochondrial respiratory chain, this, this whole functionality wow. to reduce it. So that's one way to look at it. Um, and you've developed, so you have a company called v -Light. So everyone, we're going to, you know, put the, the links in the show notes to the devices that v -Light has and all the publications and all the clinical studies around these uh, incredible devices. And for those watching on the, uh, the video channel here, um, these are two of the devices that I've had for a number of years. And Dr. Lou, you've got the, the most advanced one there. Um, so I I've got the intranasal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's and a serious uh, piece of kit. The neuro. The neuro. Yeah, and you got, it goes, there's one just like yours, it goes to the, the, the intranasal. Yep. That goes to the brain. Right. Brilliant. So yeah. for those watching on video, you can see Dr. Lou has the uh, neuro, which is one of the, the big transcranial uh, photobiomodulation devices and the ones that I've got here I've got a 655 prime it's an intranasal so and the another one with a the infrared uh, wavelength of 810 and I use those both pretty much every day to every second day for 20 minutes um, and look how good my brain's going <laughs> and, and more importantly how good my mum's brain is now going um so can you explain why intranasal so we have to get the light on the inside of the body in order for this to work now it's pretty hard to get light through your we we have uh we know about vitamin d synthesis when we're in the sun um and what an avalanche of, of things that that causes in the body, good things. Um, can you explain why intranasal and are there other methods to get it into the body? Yeah, there is, uh, you know, we've, we've got this, this uh, invented, discovered uh, in actually about, 50, yeah, it's 15 years ago now, actually mm -hmm. quite, quite, quite a long time already. And, and uh, so when we got it working because this whole field of photobiomodulation in the 80s 
got into you know a stage where the Russians started to introduce intravenous blood Lights. irradiation yep. With, yep. with red and infrared light. Now the theory is you put it there uh, instead of on your skin and you provide more power, this gets into your blood circulation directly. Mm -hmm. And what they found was it actually helps with a number of things. You know, the circulation improves better. People, uh, the, the, the users are recovering more quickly from, from injuries, from surgery. It seems to help with uh, preventing heart failures and mm -hmm. helping to recover. Yep. Then it led to studies of diabetes and, you know, and finding that our users are getting more or uh, better uh, profile yep. of the you know, marker profile from your annual you know, examination. Your checkups, yeah. Medical exam. Now, uh, then the, and then it wasn't really fully understood for a long time, but they know that the effect is systemic. Uh, and uh, quite a lot of work was done later. And uh, researchers in Israel were finding that when they direct light in animal study um, to the femur of the thigh bone, mm -hmm. you know, of the of the rodent. Yep. And they had uh, scarred heart tissue from simulated heart attack, or from simulated uh, brain injury, or yep. even not even Alzheimer's disease. They found that the recovery is better, and they can can see the improvement in the, the markers as well. Wow. And in the um, in the uh, you know not too long ago i think under a few um, a few years ago the researchers in australia uh, partic particularly at the university of sydney was trying to understand because they were doing studies in parkinson's in animals and uh, they found a, uh, a similar experiment you know uh, mice or rats they were bred with transgenic rats with parkinson's symptoms uh, actually improved when they directed light like, to the the thigh. Wow. And then they did that with uh, later on transgenic mice with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So, so even though they, it was in the thigh, it was uh, having a right, systemic uh, effect. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think there is the funded now uh, to do a study on what happens if you uh, do a probe into the brain. They have actually done it on animals and found that uh, t it seems to improve the markers in that area of the brain. Wow. So, so light does something, it does, you know, it, where it's close to it, it, it helps a lot, even though it's far away from it, it has this systemic effect. And they try to uh, explain it. At the time, the, you know, some descriptions are used, like the abscopal effect, kind of like cancer, when you treat one side, another side of the body respond. Yep. Um, they have, they call it circulating factors without knowing what it was. But it was just, uh, I think last, last year in 2019, that there was a paper published showing that uh, there are lots of free floating mitochondria in the body, in the blood. So now we understand that wow. photobiomodulation modulation affects the mitochondria. Now, what if you have now circulating mitochondria all over your body? Wow. That, that kind of uh, really, it just rung a bell, you know, to oh. many of us. That's it, you know, that's one of the main explanations of why yeah. it seems to have, a, you know, has a systemic effect because mitochondria is in your blood, your blood circulates through your system several times a minute. So it gets all over your body. And uh, there was another study in Montreal and, and two or three years back, uh, three or four years back, where the, the mitochondria also gets deposited, in, deposited into various parts of the body where it is needed. So you, you put all these together, wow. it kind of explains from yeah, the nose. Yeah, yeah. The nose is good because you know, the, the blood vessels, the, you know, are close to the surface, the membrane. So capillaries are very close, pretty dense. And then this is where it gets you know, it gets, so it gets exposure. All through your, through your whole body. 
So you, when you, you stick it up your nose, so I'm going to do, demonstrate for those watching on video, basically you, you put it up your nose like this, and uh, this is the, the 18. Um, so there's not a, there's, so all the blood in the body is going past this, this area here, isn't it? So it's actually those light waves are hitting your entire blood supply through the, the, the intranasal delivery mechanism. Is that right? Yeah, that the nasal area is actually in one of the areas where there's more uh, blood capillaries per square centimeter than most part of your body. And it's necessary because, um, you know, it controls the moisture level in your, you know, and that you get processed very quickly. Now, I'm involved in quite a lot of uh, research on its effect on the brain. And that's, that's uh, quite important. When we use the 810, Mm -hmm. nanometers in your infrared, it penetrates deeper. Yep. Uh, his, that, that suddenly hits the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is obviously part of your brain. And there's a direct channel to the memory area, like hippocampus. The hippocampus, yep. Yeah. And then uh, we've noticed improvements in memory function. Um, so that led us to, you know, later develop all these other things and do a clinical trial on Alzheimer's disease, which wow. we're doing now. Um, it also, there's a direct channel to, to the thalamus, which is thalamus does this. It, uh, it receives signals from other parts of your body and distributes to different parts of your brain to process it. Mm -hmm. But that the olfactory is very important. When you have a certain neurological condition, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and a number of other things, the, you, you lose the sense of smell. Wow. Early, before even other, other so senses. A, that's one of the warning signs of Alzheimer's, isn't it? In the left side, I, I believe, when you lose part of your smell. Yeah, so it's early, yeah. It's an early detection um, uh, thing. So the olfactory, so you obviously your smell, uh, very closely connected or very close proximity to the hippocampus, which processes memory, um, mm. and to the thalamus. No, okay. it has a direct connection actually to the hippocampus. Wow. Okay. So, um, so this is why it can have an effect. So when I'm putting the the, the V light up my nose there, the 18, that is stimulating the mitochondria in the blood that's passing that that area uh, in the brain, but also penetrating deeper into the into the hippocampus uh, yeah. and to the thalamus. Yeah. So to be technical, the direct channel is to the entorhinal cortex, mm -hmm. which is like the gateway to the, to the hippocampus. Wow. So they're kind of all part of the whole system. And you are doing a clinical trial at the moment with Alzheimer's patients, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and when, when would this, uh, you know, be, you know, it's hard to comment on a clinical trial in the middle of it, um, but what are you looking for? What's the hypothesis behind this, this clinical trial? What are you hoping to see? Well, we are... Anyway, by the way, the, the trial is suspended because of the pandemic. Oh, so, of course. Not a lot yeah. to be close to people. But, you yeah. know, our, 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 our target um, demographic is actually moderate to severe. Yep. Not wow. Most patients. Okay. And if, uh, drug companies have for a long time tried to um, address the milder form, you know, because hopefully you get a result. It, um, the, the trials have generally failed. So this is the mild cognitive impairment. So now drug companies are looking into, researching into a prodromal stage before the symptoms appear. Hopefully one day they get a, you know, be, become the vaccine, you, uh, you use it and it prevents you from getting Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> and later on, I guess they're gonna pair it with, if you have copies of certain genes that are yep. related to Alzheimer's the disease. APOE, yep. Like APOE APOE gene. Before, mm. onset and, yeah, the, yep, just had mine yeah. tested, so. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, so that's hap happening right now, but, uh, but there's a company, Biogen, I think they, they got fast, uh, they got, yeah, just recently they got fast track by, uh, for quick, re in fast track review by FDA because it shows some, uh, they reanalyzed the whole data in one of the clinical trials and say, okay, maybe there's something there. I'm not sure the details, but they're attempting, you know, to do a fast track to FDA. 
But you've got to understand that Alzheimer's disease is multifactorial. It involves many, many things. Yeah. It's just not just your genes. It's, uh, it's, it's the interplay of the genes. The markers are not just amyloid, beta amyloid, uh, or its precursors. There's the tau aspect of it. Yep. And uh, the, the growing number of scientists who believe that uh, this long held belief on the beta, beta amyloid being the main thing is maybe not, you know, the progression of Alzheimer's maybe more to do with the tau. You know, tau is where uh, these markers are associated with your neuron strangling itself from the inside. Wow. Where the beta amyloid yep. is outside. Yeah. And the synaptic. Yeah. Uh, it's dealing with. Uh, the pathogens and things that don't, you know, that are outside of the, the neurons. So there are many, many, many things in play. Genes, and genes, when you talk about genes, it's very, very complex. Yep. And then there is other factors introduced. We found that if you undergo stress or brain injury, it just triggers it. And we've, I found that to be the case as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, so so you, you, your trial's been suspended at the moment because of the pandemic. That's a, that's a mm -hmm. real shame. But what are, you you've already had a number of trials um, done in the past in different areas. What has it been shown in in those trials? What have you managed to sort of show that uh, photobiomodulation does in delivering it through these mechanisms? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, before I saw that, I just so the the interesting thing about photobiomodulation is, and this I guess it relates to functional medicine, where you try to address this whole problem at its most fun, most fundamental basic level, which is the cell, the mitochondria. Yes, mitochondria is everywhere. It, yep, all the energy comes from there, and a lot of other things happening. So I guess if you can tackle it at a very basic fundamental level. Then these other symptoms and markers that come many levels above uh, can be, you know, hopefully you will try to resolve that. That makes, that. That makes so much is, sense. That makes so yeah. much sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. But, and so what, what we're, so for this particular demographics we're doing, uh, like I mentioned, moderate to severe, and they are pretty far advanced, you know, almost all of them will require uh, the involvement of caregivers because they're not independent. And, uh, and uh, so we have a battery of tests that particularly apply to, to them, the most severe cases. But in our earlier case reports, we used, uh, you know, tests for cognitive impairment, you know, uh, ADAS you know, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease assessment scale for mm -hmm. cognition. We use MMSC, mini mental state exam. Uh, we have, uh, uh, yeah, these are amazing. Then we have clinical, you know, um, observations and reports. And so we found that we we did one. Uh, we started seriously studying Alzheimer's patients and dementia patients in 2015, and we published this in 2017. This is uh -huh. a small number of cases. <clears throat> with the, the neuron you saw, we pounds at 10 hertz, 10 times a second. And that is, we do it because it uh, it used the, 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 the data from an animal study done at Harvard and Massachusetts General by Michael Hamlin's lab. Shows mm -hmm. that pounds at 10 hertz, uh, it shows the animal recovery more quickly from brain injury. Wow. So we use 10 hertz, but he hasn't explored a whole range of you know, frequencies. So use that, it seems to help in these small studies. Then, uh, then uh, University of California, San Francisco, uh, Professor Linda Chow did a completely independent study. Um, she wanted to replicate what we did and I said, okay, use 40 hertz because 40 hertz um, in 2016, there were a lot of publications. Is to do, you know, it shows that 40 hertz is a gamma. This is uh, is associated with. It's what you find when your when your your hippocampus is trying to encode memory. So it shows 40 hertz. Uh huh. Okay. 40 hertz help with memory encoding. It helps to reduce the excitotoxicity in your brain when you you know when you're encoding memory and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then MIT 
did a very published a very important study towards the end of 2016. They, they showed that the when they direct when light pulse, when you put animal in a cage, the rodents in the cage, you pulse light just externally at 40 times a second, 40 yep. hours. Uh, they, they uh, you know, the, the markers, the beta amyloid count in the brain reduced significantly. Oh, I've heard of that. Way. I've heard of that study. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And they they've been using it. Behavior. Yep. Right. So we thought, okay, you know, they are still doing this. They're still doing studies, they're trying to do human studies. And uh, what they found was the, the markers in the visual cortex reduced drastically, but not anywhere else, not, uh -huh. not, not even the hippocampus. And I, I reckon that's because when the animals in the cage, you know, at 40 hertz, it was processed through the eyes, goes to the visual cortex, yep. and then the markers reduce significantly. Oh, so for, for, for me, so intranasal. No, I in photobiomodulation, what we do is we direct light with near infrared light so it, it can penetrate. Yep, and we, are, we target uh, at the default mode network, which is closely associated also with Alzheimer's disease. Yep, and uh, so I so I did a case, I, I did a single case. And it wasn't published. It was presented in the Alzheimer's conference. But, uh, but Linda, uh, Linda Chow did that on eight patients. Wow. Um, and then what she also, they improved, you know, over 12 weeks. And she also found that, so she's, a, she's also a professor of radiology in UCSF. So she used the MRI scan, fMRI. Oh. And found that actually after uh, after twelve weeks, the you know the 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 functions of the brain actually measured through fMRI improved significantly as well. Wow! They can improve in the default mode network. Yeah. So here she did an independent study. The subjects she used a similar scale ads cock and she did the use of MRI uh, and found that. Even through imaging, you know, it confirmed the, the behavioral changes. measures. So that's fantastic because, you know, you can argue about whether it should be a placebo study and all that, but imaging is imaging. There's exactly. You can't argue with it. Placebo, right? so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I thought that was great. And that, uh, you know, so, now we are doing this. So this you study. use, so she's using the 40 uh, hertz. Um, is it delivered through your your devices or through the intranasal and transcranial? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's not it's not like with the rat study where it's actually just in the in the room, so to speak. Right, right, it's actually right. getting mm -hmm. getting in to the so that that makes a a, a whole lot of sense. And um, so improved function over a twelve week period is a pretty short period of time. Um, I wonder what would happen if you did that for a year. You know, with with, with yeah. The, the one one thing about this in Alzheimer's disease is see all, Alzheimer's disease is neurodegenerative, so the person will just keep declining and yeah. they decline because of the genome, you know, the function of the genes, and there's uh, so there's not much you can do until you can maybe edit the genes or yeah. something like that. You can change the gene in some way. So users of, of our device will unfortunately have to use it forever yep. for the rest of their lives because this is to stop the degeneration. But the good thing is our devices are home use. Yeah, they're easy they use to home. use. Yeah. Now, uh, so I, I have to say that, you know, these, these studies are just a few, pay, a few subjects. It's very easily uh, dismissed with, you know, it's not it's statistically so we, we reserve our, our judgment or claim until we've done the full study. So that's but the thing take a is, while. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, Dr. Lou, if you have a loved one who has Alzheimer's now and you have a, and this is, a, you know, my approach with my mum, I can wait 10 years, 20 years for various clinical studies to prove that, say, hyperbaric uh, works or... Uh, um, photobiomodulation works or you know these things but these are pretty low risk uh, interventions 
Um, so my argument is, well, we'll, we'll let, you know, if, if it's my loved one, I'm definitely trying it, you know, like I want to, I, I want to use it, even if these studies are preliminary studies, and they're not yet fully accepted by the scientific community, there's a value for the person listening to this recording, who, um, you know, who wants to do something proactive now, who has a loved one who's suffering from something like this, um, to, to try, you know, um, and if, if we, you know, if we wait forever until all of the clinical trials for everything is done, you know, we all have to weigh up our own uh, risk reward scenario. Um, but, you know, in the case of my mum, um, you know, we were given no hope that she would ever have any quality of life again, massive brain damage, unable to even, she didn't know her name, no memory, no ability to move anything. By having a, a um, an approach that says, well, I'm going to try everything that is fairly low risk. So I did the risk assessment on each of the interventions that I, that I used with her. And if it wasn't a high risk, I'm going to put it in the, in the bag to do, we're going to do this. And that multi-pronged approach. Now I can't say specifically, uh, it was definitely the v Light 8110 that did it, or if it was the hyperbaric that did it, or if it was the functional genomics or the epigenetics or the nootropics, um, but it worked. And she is an anomaly and so she, she's an exceptional case. And I think it's really important that, you know, um, we have the, the right to sort of, in these low risk technologies, to have a go, you know, and, and try it. If, if you've got a loved one where it's time bound, and you you need help quickly, and this is why you know these preliminary studies are just as important, I think, as the full blown um, you know uh, clinical trials that cost a lot of money um, to and a lot of time and a lot of effort on a lot of people's part to actually have. So I think it's exciting that we have these preliminary trials. Yeah, we the devices and you know in North America like the US. So we fall under the category that is um, the guidelines of FDA def defining this as a low risk general wellness device. Mm -hmm. So we're not regulated in the US. In Canada, where we're based, uh, we're considered a consumer device because mm -hmm. we say it's low risk. You know, uh, it's a very similar category. So, uh, so we don't make a claim because yeah. it's not a you medical can't. device. Yeah. So we have slightly modified version for for medical devices that's undergoing this, it's not a lot different. The, um, the talking about what your mom's gone through, we we um, we have a trial that's a study that's going on at Boston University for traumatic brain injury, mm -hmm. and again that's suspended because of pandemic. <laughs> but that yeah. is a, that is an ongoing study, and Margaret Nazer, the professor there, mm -hmm. uh, has published some papers already and she's got I think some that's not yet published but she's talked quite a lot about uh, uh, you know traumatic brain injury getting treated with photobiomodulation she's doing this study with what we have she's uh, she's presented she's done a number of presentations I think that's being submitted for publications in the case of athletes professional football players mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they go to repeated you know banging on the head and they get yeah uh, yeah they get the cte cte which is uh then they when they as they get older they get this the symptoms are similar to alzheimer's disease yeah yeah so it's degenerative and what's happening is this repeat, repeated blows to the head has created a situation where it's uh, it's, you know the the tau accumulates yeah. and starts strangling the, the neurons in your brain shrink it goes through the atrophy, and then you get to a stage where a number of them became suicidal. They get yeah. severely depressed. Mm. Uh, they, you know, with atrophy, you're going to be cognitively impaired. There is a a, a number of um, you know professional sportsmen, football players who retired, who actually wrote have written testimonials yeah. about this and how yeah. they recovered. They're trying to tell each other, and. Uh, but again, we, we need to do these studies to to you know to be sure that it is doing what we think it's doing. Yeah. 
Well, you can check this out. One of them is Larry Carr. Larry Carr. Um, Larry, yep. his last name is Carr, C-A-R-R. -R. Yep. So you, you can Google and find his blog. He's, he's talking about it. He was, you know, he was interviewed by several newspapers. Uh -huh. And it's purely, for him, it's purely this. And he, he got, he learned about this because he went to, uh, he went to uh, the Boston University where they're supposed to be the hub of research and football at the time. These are American football players' brains. Mm. So she went, he went, he went to see Anne McKee, who is like the, probably the biggest name in the research for his CT in the brain. Mm -hmm. And she, she uh, connected him to Margaret Nazer. Mm -hmm. who got him treated with this and now he's writing about it <laughs> wow that's brilliant <laughs> to prove it you know you hope to prove it yep and, and, and even though it's anecdotal song. yeah it's anecdotal yeah. but it's actually it's one person's life that's being changed just through yeah, this yeah, yeah. yeah so margaret nacer I'll, I'll i'll look her up well, he's not the only I'll... one um, there was another paper that just published uh, mm -hmm. with a professional hockey player ice hockey um, who got treated again by Linda Chow at UCSF. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had, you know, brain injury, all this stuff, and now his symptoms improved, and she did. Now, what, what she did was very interesting, and that's never been done. She, again, she's a professor of radiology, and she, she found, used MRI scan, and found that his, his brain actually regrew because wow. of MRI. Yep. Uh, they could measure the volume. Wow, the growth and volume in the brain. <clears throat> wow, so that is that is quite profound. <clears throat> I can send you this link. Yes, please. Oh, uh, yep. no, hang on. Actually, it hasn't been published. I've got the pre-published. The pre-published. You won't have to wait. <laughs> it's been a publication. So it'll come on frontiers of neurology, in maybe in the next couple of issues. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, this is an exciting area of of medicine that you know, looking at all of these things. Um, and, and whether it's for mitochondria for, 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 for wellness and, and producing more energy. And, you know, at the basis of so many diseases is mitochondrial insufficiency and problems with the mitochondria. Um, so mm -hmm. anything that can help support the mitochondrial is going to help everybody, <laughs> probably. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's an exciting area. Look, Dr. Lou, I won't keep you much longer because you've been very, very generous with your time today. Um, oh, not so a problem. It's been it's marvelous. I'm I'm absolutely fascinated with this area, and I really want to thank you for the work you're doing because it is due to people like you uh, that you know the one of the reasons why my mum is now completely normal again after you know this long battle, um, and it's one of the the tools and devices that was very very helpful for her. And no, I can't prove that clinically in a clinical trial setting, but that is my uh, belief um, and and therefore it was really important for me to share this information about photobiomodulation and to give people the awareness to be able to start to know what it is about and to do a deeper dive themselves and to watch out for the studies that are coming through and to try your devices out. So Dr. Lou, where can people um, contact you and your team um, and to check out the devices. Um, actually, we've got a code. Um, I've got a code Tamati, just the word Tamati at checkout. If anybody wants to buy one of Dr. Lou's devices, um, you can use that and get a 10% discount. Just use the word Tamati at checkout. His team has kindly provided that uh, for me. Um, so Dr. Lou, where can they uh, contact, uh, reach out to you and your team? Um, and what's the best way to do that? Yeah, go to the website. You can. There is a page where you can ask questions, or you write to info at vlight dot com. Info at vlight dot com. Um, yep. address it. And yeah, we. So next next time we can talk about what it does for sports. That okay, excellent. <laughs> yeah, because this is you. We mentioned. Some work there. Yeah, you 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 mentioned uh, before we went into the interview and started recording that this is this new area that you're going into. Uh, for sports people uh, to help with things like coordination and motor uh, abilities. Um, so this is another very exciting area of research. Yeah, yeah. And also how to handle, you know, the stress of a competition. You know, um, that, that's huge. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, we're also about to start a study on meditation. Ah, that's what we and haven't covered. I wanted a cognition to ask. study. Yeah. So it's what comes out of it. Meditation is super exciting. Uh, it's uh, 
we've we've found that uh, especially this is especially for long term meditators. Yes, and they get uh, so long term meditators have endogenous gamma in the brain. You know, they get mm -hmm. switched on to that state quickly. But we can, um, you know, we have another device called a Neuro Pro where we can pulse from anything from zero to ten thousand hertz. And long term meditators have a window. You get into that particular frequency, they just get into an altered state right away. Wow. That's very exciting. <laughs> wow, that's exciting. So I'll be able to, you know, like instead of spending 40 years uh, trying to work out how to meditate properly and to quickly get into these altered states uh, that, that happen in meditation, we may be able to just put, plug in a device, your device, and uh, get there much, much quicker into a relaxed and meditative state and have the right brain waves going so that's it and um, so you've got can you just explain before we do wrap up um the different brain waves and what is stimulated by uh the photobiomodulation and what what is down regulated as far as brain waves goes yeah we are <clears throat> we are noticing that we can induce you know certain brain waves and influence the brain waves in the brain, uh, hopefully, to you know, for the brain to function better. Yeah. So when you, you your when your brain gets into a certain state, whether you're relaxed or you're stressed, you're processing information or you you get into a certain zone, uh, it, they can be identified with certain brain wave patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are suffering from attention deficit, you, your brain wave patterns are exhib exhibited in a certain way. We are all different too, and. Uh, so we recognize that and, and we are still in a learning process. You know, uh, I, I give you an example. You, you can be, you are maybe not able to focus and pay attention because say your brain is locked into the very slow waves. Mm -hmm. you, and it's difficult to get out of it. Yep. And if you can, so this is hyper coherence. And if you can break that up, and I think there's a way to break it up by introducing, uh, asynchronous patterns and you can free yourself out of, out of this locked in wow you know, and situation. change your brain that, wave state yeah that's that's hypothetical but we're going to do a lot of studies uh to do that we got we have a new yeah we have this very advanced model is going through beta testing now uh is going to help us to explore because now we'll we'll be able to see okay this person is getting his eeg is looking this way uh, is not right and we want to change you to this, mm -hmm. then let's induce a certain brain wave correct, wave, wavelength to correct it and see what happens. That's hypothetical. Wow. And uh, I, I just did a, a presentation um, for the neurofeedback conference talking about various types of brain stimulation. And people are trying to achieve that state, but I think, I think we'll be closer than anybody else where the, we can do you know, and a closed loop processing. If your brain is showing this EEG, but you want to achieve another one, it automatically reset the parameters wow. to correct it right away. Automatically. And that, that would be <laughs> so powerful because then I'd be able to go from a state of high performance into a state of relaxation within minutes, perhaps. And then to right, sleep, right, perhaps, yeah. and, and lower my stress levels. You know, <laughs> as someone who has problems with um, too many, too too much brain. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I need to be able to slow things down. So, so being able to do something like that and change. So, which are the the the, the gamma? Uh, so you got alpha, beta, uh, theta, gamma. Which ones are you wanting to upregulate if you're wanting to increase co cognitive performance? as opposed to reducing stress and slowing okay. down. You know what uh, I'm finding is when your brain is encoding, processing information and trying to absorb, it's, uh, it's encoding at very high frequencies, like uh -huh. high gamma, maybe 80 gamma. hertz, you know. And when you are reproducing it, it could be 40. I'm, I'm trying, and then I've, I've seen studies, uh, should be 10, because 10 is where you're more relaxed as well. Uh -huh. um, and then there are cognitive uh, performance enhancement where they show you should be coupled with uh, well, memory processing data, which is quite which is very slow, about let's say four, five, six hertz, and, and gamma. So I yeah I've got uh, and uh, so you you 
you reproduce it where the gamma fast wave is actually coupled with the slow wave. So in the slow cycle, you see the fast one. Wow. And, and that, that, is, that is all possible, just knowing which part of the brain is being produced. Wow. So, so that for cognitive enhancement, I'm actually looking at that right now. But, uh, but I say, you know, if you are learning, you're training, you're trying to process information, uh, you, you, you want to help your brain, but, you know, if you can induce fast frequencies doing that, and when you go into competition, you want to be uh, collected and you want to be able to reproduce it and not too slow. You, you want to be, you know, perhaps 10 hertz, which is the alpha to uh -huh. keep you keep for a tennis yourself. player. You've got someone who is uh, very, very highly ranked in the world mm -hmm. circuit who's using our device, the alpha. Wow. And winning. So, <laughs> well, that's good. So that, that is, uh, <laughs> you know, that is, because, you know, a tennis match goes on over five hours. Yeah, crazy. You know, all the time, you've got to be strategizing and thinking and not just like reacting all the time, right? Yep. So that's... And, uh, so we may good. be able to, in future, be able to influence the state that we want to be in for that particular time, whether that's distress reduction or whether that's high performance or whether that's, you know, cognitive enhancement. So that's a really exciting... Yeah. Uh, area to to, to yeah, be involved in be yeah. Very, yeah and not all of us have got you know 10 hours a day to sit around on a mountain in tibet um learning from the monks unfortunately that would be fantastic but if we can shortcut that process perhaps <laughs> to getting to the right well, brainwave we, state well meditation studies are, are dealing with people who are already pretty advanced but yeah get them into that stage like this is a snap of a finger you know wow very quickly that sounds excellent um, yeah that, that, that sounds like something I need, for sure. <laughs> oh, okay, Dr. Lou, well, thank you very much for your time today, for all this incredible work that you're doing, um, all the good that you're doing in the world. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of my mum as well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, yeah, oh, it's, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Um, so everybody go to vlight.com, that's V-I-E-L-I-G-H-T.com. And if you're wanting to purchase any of the um, devices that are available to the consumer, use the code TAMITY at checkout and get a 10% uh, discount. And if you've got any questions for Dr. Lou and his team, please reach out to him there on the contact page there. So Dr. Lou, thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been fantastic. <laughs>